Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Here we are celebrating the month of Wesak at Power Buddha School. The month where we celebrate the birth, the enlightenment, and the passing to Parinibbana of the Buddha. I actually want to keep today's talk quite short because being Buddhist Christmas, you're probably completely worn out by all the talks about Wesak. What I really want to do is move on to a question and answer session where you can ask all the questions that you wanted to ask about Buddhism but you thought were too naughty and were afraid to ask. Because it lines up very well with the school's philosophy that we become enlightened through the search for knowledge. And the search of knowledge always comes with questions. But questions need to have some context. The story of the Buddha is the quintessential hero story. It's a story of a man who one day, like we all must one day, realizes that there is suffering, that there is old age, that there is illness and there is death. There is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair and we have to do something about it. It's a story of a man who sets out on a journey to do something about it. What does he do? He gives up the worldly life. He searches out, teaches, does his best to perfect those teachings, and it seems did perfect those teachings, and then went further, found it was not enough journeys on his own, sacrifices himself in many different ways until he finds the key to the ending of suffering, becomes fully enlightened. But then the journey does not end with his enlightenment. It could have ended there if he chose, but instead he chooses to spend the next 45 years of his life from the age of 36 until the age of 80, till his very last breath, teaching others how to become enlightened, sharing his enlightenment with others. That is the full cycle of the hero's journey, where you start with a question. How do I bring an end to suffering? How can I make life meaningful in the face of the bare and sometimes unbearable reality of old age, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair? And you try, you experiment, you fail, you get back on your feet and you try again until you find the answer. You transform yourself. You rise out of your own ashes like a phoenix. You purify yourself like an alchemist does gold until you find the answers. And then out of compassion, you go further. You share what you know with others so that they too can go through the same journey that they too can purify themselves and gradually bring an end to suffering once and for all. That is everybody's story. From a Buddhist perspective, that is the story of beings over billions and billions of lifetimes. That we are in this samsara because we are living this live action role play and we keep getting it wrong. <laughs> And the universe gives these opportunities to us, life after life after life, to work it out, a little bit like a computer game. You've got infinite lives. You die, you make a mistake, you get reborn again, and you get another go. And the game doesn't end with the lives. The game ends when you beat the game. The hero story in its cycle, its essential patterns, is the story of education. It is the story of science. It 
It is the dream of all societies to better themselves through education. And education systems have to go through that same hero story. We cannot become complacent. We have to cobble something together, try to make something live, something that works. And then we have to be honest to ourselves when things don't work. And then we need to burn ourselves up like phoenixes and then start again from the ashes and rise. It's the story of science. You start with a hypothesis based upon the information that you've got on, at hand. You look for more information and you're honest about the way that you collect it. And then you test whether or not your hypothesis really fits the information. And quite often you find the answer is no. And you've got to be honest. You've got to be able to stand up and say, you know, yesterday I was really sure about this hypothesis. I was really sure that the world is flat. And today I've done some measurements with the stars. I've done some mathematics and the evidence is quite clear to me. And I've got to be honest, I was completely wrong before. It's humiliating, it's egg on my face. I don't like saying it, but I'm committed to the truth here. It's not about me. Science, education has to be heroic. Science is a tradition. Education is a tradition. It's building blocks on top of each other. It's a beautiful thing when you can, as Newton said, stand on the shoulder of giants. But the problem is, giants often have weak bones, or it's more like when you're playing Jenga. If you take out just one of the pieces because it doesn't belong there, then the whole thing can come crashing down. And we so often get attached to our vision of Buddhism, our vision of science, our vision of education, and we refuse to do what needs to be done. Tell the truth. Talk about the elephant inside the room. And we refuse to do that because the truth, that elephant, is that Jenga block. And we think we have so much to lose. We often say, it's easy to not understand something when our livelihood is dependent upon not understanding it. This is why the Buddha, on his hero's journey, had to give up everything in order to find the truth. Now, of course, not everybody needs to become a monk or a nun. This Vesak ceremony is not my attempt to convert you all into the new early Buddha Sangha. But we need to have that heart, that heart who goes on the hero's journey just like the Buddha and is willing to give things up willing to make sacrifices for the truth as opposed to sacrifice the truth for the sake of our stuff. So, with that primer in mind, I'd like to open the floor up for discussion so that we can talk about all those things you've been afraid to ask, in particular maybe afraid asking a monk, because we tend to be a bit grumpy particularly when you ask us hard questions that we, can't, that we can't answer. But I promise you, I won't be grumpy at you very much. <laughs> and if I don't know the answer, then I'll tell you. And whatever answers I can give you anyway, you need to remember, I'm not fully enlightened, so I'm probably wrong. But I do my best. So does anybody have any questions about the myths of Buddhism, which they'd like to have busted? Mr. Bao. Um, maybe you should be leaving it to other people, but um, I'm kind of hungry for this one. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people come in here and they ask the school about its lineage mm. in Buddhism. And now that you're here, they also ask about you. Mm. Who's your teacher? What's um, your lineage in Buddhism? Sure. Who's my teacher? Because they're grounding in the fact that if there is no lineage, then this Buddhism is fake. 
Yes. We are false. Yes. We are misleading people. Yes. Well, Mr. Bauer, I really like the way that you phrase that question. Is this fake Buddhism? Or fake Buddha quotes, a little bit like fake news. Well, I like that because, you know, I'm on the internet from time to time and I like to look through the surface of things. And anybody who knows anything knows that the fake news isn't the fake news. It's the mainstream news that's the, it's the fake news. So the mainstream calls the independent people fakes because the mainstream's afraid that independent people might actually point out to the populace at large that the mainstream news is actually the fake news. So they point fingers first. Now this is a pattern that we always find whenever doctrines become mainstreamed and in particular livelihoods get built around those doctrines. Institutions, very large institutions get built and people, a lot of people got things to lose. And it's very natural, I can understand it, why then people start to become afraid of the truth and then start calling the truth the fake, the counterfeit. The Buddha even said it was happening inside his day. And there's a sutta where he's having a conversation with Mahakasapa. And Mahakasapa is talking about how the stand of the monks is really sliding and that the young monks don't want to participate in, um, in particular, hard living anymore, in asceticism. And the Buddha says that um, the, the Dhamma, people lose faith in the Dhamma when a fake Dhamma arises. Patirupaka Dhamma, counterfeit Dhamma. In the same way that people lose faith in gold when fake gold arises. So for those who know political economy, uh, when people print money instead of using currency backed, um, sorry, commodity backed currencies, then people think gold is stupid and think, well, we just print money until the day that we die. So the truth is that the Buddha left very clear instructions inside the suttas that there is only one teacher inside this dispensation, the Buddha. And he said, after I die, I shall have no successor in terms of being the teacher. The successor is the suttas. Yovo ananda maya dhammo vinyo desito panyato sovo mang achayena satta ananda Whatever Dhamma and discipline I have taught and formulated for you all, that shall be your teacher when I am gone. So my teacher is the Buddha, and now that he's passed in Parinibbana, my teacher is the Suttas. Now people usually have a problem with this because they say, well, texts are very unreliable, and I agree. Absolutely. I think it's changes of time, there are interpolations, mutations. We can misunderstand cultural references. All of those things are a problem. But of course, all of those things are problems with what we understood of yesterday. <laughs> yeah? It doesn't stop us from referring to yesterday so that we can inform the way that we're living today. So the fact that it's problematic doesn't mean we throw babies out with bathwater and just throw up our hands and give up. What we should do instead is go th through things systematically and scientifically. We should do textual studies on the suttas and work out the probabilities, is this strata of text reliable or unreliable? Or at the very least, is it more reliable or less reliable? Because there's no absolutes about these things. And then after we work out which texts are most likely to be reliable, it makes sense for a Buddhist to have integrity and then start referring to those texts. But you can't stop there because texts don't read themselves. What you need to do then is interpret the text. You need to hypothesize. You say, I think this means X. Or it could also mean, prima facie, could also mean Y. And now, because X is the most likely interpretation, I am going to practice X. I'm going to use my own mind and body as a laboratory. And I'm going to see what happens when I practice X. So in Buddhism, what are we trying to do? Very simple. We're trying to get rid of our greed, our hatred, and our delusion. So if you practice X and your greed and hatred and delusion go up, then you know you've got the wrong interpretation. If you practice X and your greed and hatred and delusion go down, and in particular go down much faster, then the greed, hatred, and delusion goes down through other discourses. Because that's the claim of Buddhism. That the practice here 
is similar to other practices, but it's special in the sense that it's just much more effective and it goes further. So if your greed, hatred, and delusion goes down much faster than any other practice that you've done before, then you know you're onto a good thing. So at this point, the argument often comes apart when people say, but you can't know yourself. There's no way you can know your own greed, hatred, and delusion. You need a living teacher who's already enlightened, who doesn't have any delusion whatsoever, who can say to you, oh, yes, your greed, hatred, and delusion are going down, and therefore you're on the right track. And to that I say, well, it's not true. You can tell whether or not you're angry. You can tell whether or not you've woken up in the morning and you're grumpy and you say to everybody at breakfast table, I've woken up on the wrong side of the bed. Now you'd say that because you actually know that you're much grumpier today than you were yesterday. Or if you're trying to lose weight and the moment you walk past the, the coffee shop and all the cakes are explained out the front, you notice that you really feel like eating chocolate cake. And then you decide, right, I need to avoid that coffee shop from now on. Right? You make that decision because you can tell that your lust has gone up the moment you see the, the cake at the front of the coffee shop. So on this experience alone, we, we can tell, at least at a certain degree, how the greed, hatred, and delusion is happening on the inside. Yeah? You don't know it completely, and that's fine. You just work with what you've got. That's how we do everything. If you say to a baby, right, you can't walk, you're not perfect already, and therefore you're never going to learn. Your nervous system isn't very well developed, so you can't really monitor for yourself perfectly how well you're walking, and therefore you're never going to learn. Then we might as well give up on everything. So we have common sense. When we're learning something, we say, sure, I'm imperfect, but I can pull myself up from my bootstraps. I use what I've got, and I just get to the next imperfect level. And then from there, I get to the next imperfect level. And so on and so on and so on. And this is what the Buddha described all the way to enlightenment. So from this, I can say that I've got two teachers, really. I've got the suttas. And I've got reality. I've got the results of my experiments as my teacher. And it's a very harsh teacher, let me tell you. But it's a good teacher if you're willing to listen. Now, I love the traditions. If it weren't for the traditions, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I'm a much healthier, happier, wise, compassionate, and humble person today thanks to the traditions. When I left my ordination monastery, Nayuena, so some background, I'm a Theravada monk ordained in Sri Lanka ordained at a famous monastery called Nayuena, famous for very good vineyard, part of the forest revival movement in Sri Lanka. My Upajaya is uh, Venerable Arya Dhamma, recently deceased, um, famous across Sri Lanka for his encyclopedic memory, in that he'd memorized the, the Abhidhamma and I think the suttas and the Vinaya Pitika as well. I love the tradition, but I left it. I left my ordination monastery with tears on my face. Because I love the traditions, I'm willing to, as gently as I can, but effectively as I can, just point out what we can do better. Because it's a very dangerous delusion to believe that we're perfect when we're not. For a tradition to believe that it's got all the answers when it doesn't necessarily. Ideas become inbred in this way. Mutations in ideas through this process of Chinese whispers can make things much, much worse over time if people don't stand up and speak the truth. The Buddha himself, in many different places inside the suttas, was very, very critical of the blind leading the blind. The great thing about being blind is that if you don't know that you're blind, you are able to confirm everything that you say to yourself as being correct. You're able to rationalize. And that process can't go on forever, though, if you're constantly exposed to reality. 
if you don't live inside an ivory tower where everybody tells you exactly what you want to hear and nobody ever shares with you the mistakes that you're making and you don't have to bear yourself the consequences of your own actions. So we see this as a pattern in history in all institutions, religious, financial, educational, government. The problem is always if the leaders, in particular the leaders, shield themselves from reality and they don't have to bear with the consequences of their own decisions. How did the Buddha of the suttas look to solve that problem for people who would naturally become leaders over time? He knew that the Sangha would become the religious leaders over time. He asked the Sangha to do it tough, to live ascetically, to walk around barefooted, to collect their food on the streets, eat one meal per day unless they're sick. Because when you live this way, you're walking on a very tight, tightrope and you can tell whether or not you're falling off a tightrope there's just no wiggle room for self-deception there's a lot of reality there's to beat you around if you get things wrong you live inside the school of hard knocks so basically it's like this if you're an ascetic and you get it wrong you get sick real fast and you'll go mad real fast as well. So if the individual practitioner is honest with themselves, they'll constantly correct themselves as they go. They'll say, right, my greed, hatred, delusion are really going up here. I need to change. But if they don't, they get sick and they go mad, which often means that they won't be able to take the lifestyle anymore. But if they do, if they're just real gluttons for punishment and they keep on going, then at the very least, nobody will follow them. Because ordinary lay people with common sense aren't going to follow a smelly mad guy who walks around the streets with three robes that absolutely stink. So the conventional answer to the question is that um, I have an ordination master, my upajaya, Venu um, Aryadhamma, he's deceased now. And I belong to the Theravada ordination lineage in terms of Vinaya. But my true teacher is the Buddha and my true teacher is reality. Are there any other questions? We've still got about 50 minutes. If you need something to, to loosen up your throat, we can hum again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in the um, Metta Sutta, hmm. just a more general question you want to make. Sure. Um, it says uh, to be on unburdened with duties. Hmm. What, what exactly does that, does that mean? Does that yeah. live a simple life? Or yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. All right, so let's turn it into a bit of a myth-busting question. So does, is the teaching of Buddhism a teaching of being a Dharma bum, where you um, have no responsibilities, and because you have no responsibilities, life is easy. You don't need to stress out about anything, and um, then you become enlightened. So, no. So, in fact, Buddhism is a religion of duties, but depending on the way that you decide to practice, the, the duties will take different forms. Human beings need to work. The reason why unemployment is a problem is not necessarily because um, you won't have the income that you need when you're unemployed in a, uh, a welfare state. The problem is that human beings feel terrible about themselves when they don't work. They feel terrible about themselves and not doing something that they feel is actually contributing to the greater good. Actually, the happiest life is a life where you're working all the time. But 
there needs to be balance. You need to be working all the time in the sense that you're doing something all the time that is contributing to the greater good. It doesn't mean working all the time like you're sitting in front of the computer at the office 18 hours a day and typing like mad <laughs> or pretending to do work like mad <laughs> and being stressed out 18 hours a day or in your sleep as well 24 hours a day. I mean, there are times where you've got to go hard because the work's just really hard. The work of contributing to society is really, really hard. But then because we're limited human beings, and all of us are different. Some of us are more resilient than others. But all of us, in the end, we've got limited resources. We have to work inside of limits. And so we need to measure what our limits are and then go hard to the extent that we can without burning out and then have rest time as well. But what we want to do is ensure that our rest time isn't pure self-indulgence. That our rest time is in some way contributing to the greater good as well. So for example, your rest time may be meditation. Right? That meditation is not there for you to have fun per se. It can be fun if you know how to do it well. But that meditation is there for you to improve yourself as a person to make your body stronger, to make your mind clearer, so that you can power your way through enlightenment, make an end to suffering, and share with others the way to the ending of suffering. So what we need to do is look at their own context of our lives, look at the duties that we have. So obviously the duties of lay people are very different to the duties of monks. And then we need to structure our lives very, very carefully so that we're able to capably and ideally, excellently, fulfill our duties to ourselves and to others without burning out. That's what it means to be unburdened with duties. It doesn't mean to have no duties. Yeah, it's not that you're weighed down and it makes you tired and, un and eventually gets to a point where you feel like you can't go on anymore. Yes? Uh, I read about your four Brahma Viharas. Yes. Yes. So there's um, Mudita, Karuna, Metta, Preksha. Mm. I'm interested about that fourth one, which is Preksha, yeah. which is enmity. Yes. How can we practice that? Okay. The Brahma Vihara is literally translated as um, the abodes of God. So Brahma is the ancient Indian version of God and possibly connected to the Abrahamic languages, because Brahma, take add an A and it's Abrahma, right? Abraham. Abrahamic um, religions often teach that God is love, so there's the connection as well. So the Brahma Viharas can be thought as the four faces of love, or what we've got on our poster outside, or posters outside, the four ways to train in love, because it happens to be that. Um, the next week and a half have the theme of the Brahma Viharas at the school. Okay, so in old Indian literature, Brahma has four faces. He's looking at all the different directions at the same time. And he's looking at all the different directions at the same time with love. And there are four kinds of love. There's metta. So variously um, translated, loving kindness being the most common. I translate it as collegiality. The second is karuna, compassion. The third is mudita, usually translated as appreciative joy or uh, altruistic joy. I just translate it as either appreciation or gratitude. And the fourth one is upekka, or upeksha in Sanskrit, which is usually translated as equanimity. I translate it as objectivity. So 
I'm describing all four of the Brahma Viharas before getting on to um, Upekka because it's often misunderstood that the Brahma Viharas can be um, separated and that you just practice one of them and then you, you specialize that and then that's it. And they'll take you to the jhanas and the jhanas will take you to Nibbana. Whenever the Buddha gives a list, a discrete list inside the suttas, one that just appears in all sorts of places, the reason why it's a list is because they're all meant to be practiced together. So, for example, you will never ever see the Buddha just teaching faith. Faith always belongs in a list, and inside that list it will always include wisdom. Right? So, with the Brahma Viharas, if you're going to have Upekka, you also need to have Metta, Karuna and Mudita at the same time. It's just that whenever you're doing anything in life, what tends to happen is one thing will be out the front, and that's the thing that you can see, and then everything else will operate in the background. So you can specialise in Upekka if you want, but it can only be deep, sustaining and effective if you've actually developed the others enough for them to constantly operate inside the background. Upeko is usually translated as equanimity, so that gives us a sense of, of balance. The Buddha says that if you want to develop upeka, then you need to understand this phrase. You are the heir of your kamma, the owner of your kamma, born of your kamma, related to your kamma, have your kamma as your refuge, and... Whatever you do, good or bad, of that you shall be the heir. So it's clearly not just about being balanced, and that's a part of it. What it's really about is thinking in terms of cause and effect. Doing, and then knowing the consequences of your actions and owning those consequences. Taking responsibility for those things. Instead of thinking egoically, so it's thinking in terms of cause and effect instead of thinking in terms of it's right because I say so. It's right because it's my opinion. That's, think, that's thinking egoically. So I think the word that better describes upeka is objectivity because that's, what we, that's the normal English word we use whenever we describe. I'm trying to separate myself from the situation. Yeah, it's my own child and my child has lost the football game and everything inside me says that they should have won. But now I'm going to be objective about it. He's not very good. <laughs> Their team is clearly not very good compared to the other team. I'm looking at the way they kick the ball and they can't kick straight. The other team can kick straight. All right, fair enough. <laughs> the other team's better. You can't do that, though, if you don't have metta. The only way you could do that in this football team example is that if you had a sense of friendship with the other side, if you hated the other side's guts, and you weren't able to overcome that, you saw them as the other, the complete other, the enemy. There's no way that you'll be, your mind will allow you to say, actually, oh, they're the better team. And there's no way to do that um, without karuna, without compassion. Compassion is the ability to love through pain. Right? So admitting that your child's team is not so good is a really painful thing. And it's only when you can feel soft on the inside with compassion that you can get some distance from the situation and go, all oh, right, yeah, Johnny's really bad at football. <laughs> The apple of my eye is terrible. And we need to do something about that. And there's no way we can admit that the other side is a really fantastic football team unless we've got some, um, we've got some mudita. The ability to appreciate what is good and to celebrate it and feel the pleasure in that. So people tend to have different personality types, right? Some people are very friendly, so they'll be a metta type. 
but they need to have the rest operating in the background. Or they can be a person who's really concerned with the suffering of, of, of others, so for a compassion type, but they need to have the other three operating. They can be a real um, gratitude type, need to have the other three operating. Or they can be just a, a very um, objective type. You know, the, the sort of person that children go, when you've got a playground full of kids, there's always this kid that just seems to be really objective about everything. So the kids always just go to that guy to adjudicate who won the marbles game. What you don't need to have upeka is um, vipassana jnana. Right? You know, depending on the system of Buddhism, sometimes they say you need to have really deep meditation like the jhanas and then you come out of that and you get vipassana jnana, this special thing that ordinary people don't have. Or if you're a part of a system that says you can have vipassana jnana without meditation, it's still something that ordinary people don't have. Right? Early Buddhism is all about getting you to notice all the things that you already have and then getting you to cobble them together in the right combinations and make them stronger and stronger and stronger on top of themselves. It's a pulling yourself up by the bootstrap sort of process. Yeah, so everybody in this room already has upekka. They just may not have noticed it yet. And then you can use it to get the other Brahma Viharas to become very, very strong in the art of love in all situations. Sure. You're nice as many as you like, the way things are going, sorry. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, given that the Buddha taught that, what do you think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, another common myth, a misunderstanding inside Buddhism. The idea that you're not allowed to be selfish. As the Dalai Lama says, there's nothing wrong with selfishness. You want enlightened selfishness. The kind of selfishness where you do things to benefit yourself and which benefit everybody else at the same time. <laughs> Or at the very least, if you're going to benefit yourself, never harm anybody else. Because it's not always to concoct situations where you can um, get everybody to win. Right? But at the very least, if you're going to do something, uh, make sure that it doesn't harm anybody else. Or it doesn't harm anybody else in the long term. Now, as um, writers on political economy often point out, aligning self-interest with the interests of others is incredibly important. Um, there are some people who are just absolutely beautiful and they really don't care whether or not they get anything themselves. And they'll just go day after day after day after day helping everybody else and they're able to do it, right? That's 0.00001% of the population. I'd say there's about 5% of the population who would like to be able to help everybody else as much as they can no matter what, but then they burn out and they become grumpy and resentful. Yeah. 
Look, we're ordinary people with limits. Systems need inputs and outputs. If it's only output, then the system gets drained. So it makes sense that if you're going to help others, that you help yourself at the same time so you don't get drained. Ideally, help yourself in such a way that you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger so that you're more able to teach people, more able to help other people. So yes, it's fine to do things for yourself. So long as you're not harming anybody else, ideally you're helping other people at the same time. The second aspect of that question is connected with the idea of expectations. Yeah. So it's often misunderstood inside Buddhism that this is a teaching of just being in the present moment and therefore you can't have expectations because the moment you have an expectation you're thinking about the future. And the moment you're not inside the present moment you can't do anything right. But that's not the way it is in early Buddhism. Early Buddhism is a really common sense teaching. It's about cause and effect. Right? And so because it's about cause and effect you have to think about the future. Because effects happen in the future. And also you have to think about the past because you can only work out patterns of cause and effect by reviewing the patterns that you've experienced from the past. So the importance of studying history where you can see in a really global way the way things pan out for human beings over a long period of time. They choose to have certain ideas and behave in certain ways. So from this perspective... You know, from the perspective of teaching about cause and effect, expectations are very, very important. So we are talking about experimenting and hypothesizing before. If you're running an experiment and you've got no expectations about what's going to happen with the experiment, it's not really an experiment. You hypothesize and you say, right, if I do this, this and this, that's going to happen. And then you do it and you see if that actually happens. And if it doesn't happen, then you go to say, right, my hypothesis is wrong. Something else is going on here. So it's very important to, when trying to construct for ourselves a wise life, to have certain expectations for the way that we want our own lives to go. And also expectations for the way that we want our community to go then we can do things and after we've done them we're in a position to see whether or not we've done it the right way. Yeah, so if I give a Dhamma talk and I have no expectations whatsoever and then nobody turns up to my talks because I'm a terrible speaker and I tell bad jokes and I'm grumpy yeah? and, I, and then nobody comes to my talks and I just keep giving them and I say oh, I don't care I've got no expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wasting my time, right? I might as well be just talking to a brick wall. <laughs> but if I'm wise and I think, right, the reason why I'm giving talks, you know, the reason why I'm giving talks is to benefit other people with the beneficial experiences that I've had. Obviously what I want is for people to hear it. Right? So if I'm giving my talks in such a way, which means everybody's running out the door, then I'm doing something wrong. I'm not getting what I expect. Yeah? And so I change. Now, Mr. Powell tells me all sorts of things all the time about what I'm doing. My brother, in particular, tells me all sorts of things all the time about what I'm doing. And I always invite people in general to give me feedback. So I can constantly change the way that I'm doing things, become a better person. That's why expectations are really, really important as well. So if you're expecting ayu, wangwo, sukang balang, life, beauty, happiness and strength from your practice of the Dhamma, and you're not getting life, beauty, happiness and strength, you need to be asking why. So it's not something that like, you get straight away, right? Like, <laughs> 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 why do you ask that question? <laughs> Yes, you do. Yes, so um, a lot of these things um, are a long-term project. Um, so it's good, therefore, um, to have expectations about what happened in the long term, but also you should have an idea, some expectations, about what things are going to look like on that journey. 
and that way you can test and review on the journey as well. It's a very big problem if you can't test halfway along because you're going to end up being disempowered where a teacher says to you, I know you're getting sicker, <laughs> I know you're getting uglier, I know you're getting weaker, and you look like you're about to die, <laughs> but just keep going. And one day, poof, it'll turn around for you. So it's a very good way to start cults, where the... The practice is not effective, but you're led to believe you can't review halfway through on your own. What you want instead is a practice where ordinary people can review themselves and the ordinary people can review the teacher as well. The Buddha described the Dhamma as being like a sea. It slopes gradually. There's no sudden progress in this Dhamma and discipline. That's early Buddhism. So if you're walking deeper into the ocean with your eyes closed, how can you tell that you're, you're walking into the ocean as opposed to walking to, towards the land? How? Because Wrong answer. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, but what is it about the water, the experience of the water touching your skin? What is it about that that tells you are going towards the ocean, not towards dry land? Smell. Sorry? Exactly. It gets deeper. So even if your eyes are closed, you don't have perfect sight. You can still feel the water moving up past your knees, towards your waist, up to your chest. And all right, I'm going towards the sea. But if you're walking the opposite direction, and then it goes from your chest down to your knees, down to your ankles, you know you're walking towards dry land. You don't have to be enlightened to, to make that judgment call. So... There are, there are all sorts of very concrete signs of progress in the Dhamma. One of them is um, improvement in your memory. And that's a really important one because sati, the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Way, in its most ordinary uh, meaning actually means memory. Another one is general improvement in um, mental, emotional and physical health. So everybody actually starts at a different level. So you can't tell whether or not a person's... Um, you can't say that a person has bad practice uh, because they're not an iron man, right? But they just got ordinary health. You need to know what they look like when they started practicing. They may have been really, really unhealthy when they started practicing and now they're at the level of everybody else. But at least that comparison needs to be made. So, for example, if after you start meditating really, really seriously, and this happens a lot inside monk circles, you get mysterious illnesses that nobody can diagnose. So in monk circles, this is known as MMI, mysterious monk's illness. That's a very strong indication you're doing something really wrong. It's the same as um, the suttas where the Buddha's talking to the Jains. And the Jains are like just torturing themselves. And they're saying, oh, we're, we're doing it because it's, it's, our, it's our karma. You know? We've got no choice about this. And so the Buddha is just asking them a really simple question. Right, so when you're doing these really austere practices, do you experience a whole lot of pain? And they say, yeah, we do. That's the point. Okay, so when you're not doing those practices, do you experience a whole lot of pain? No. <laughs> So the Buddha says, so isn't it clear that it's not your karma, it's what you're doing that's causing these problems? So in the same way, we can get certain ideas inside of our head that, okay, um, all things are going wrong inside of my practice and it's my karma. And then somebody just needs to ask a com common sense questions. So your, your bad knees, your bad back, the constant headaches... Did you have those before you started meditating, before you became a Buddhist? And often people will say, no, I was just a normal guy before. <laughs> okay, so you're telling me that the bad knees, the bad back, the headaches, that all really started when you became a serious Buddhist. Yeah. Okay, you need to change your practice. That's right, yeah. Same as any other skill at school, right? So 
So the reason why we're constantly tested at school is not because we're trying to torture our kids. It's because they need feedback. And it's just kids don't like feedback. Nobody likes feedback generally, actually, because feedback tends to be painful. <laughs> so we can save other people the, the trouble of testing us because testing other people and giving them feedback is itself painful as well. So teaching is a really hard job. We can make it much easier for everybody else in our life if we deliberately criticise ourselves, not in a hateful way, but in terms of just review, right? Being honest to ourselves and saying, okay, I'm doing that fantastic, I'm doing this terribly. And I need to work on that, abandon what's unwholesome in that, emerge into the wholesome, and all this stuff I'm doing fantastic is already wholesome, I need to further develop that. Pat yourself on the back and further develop it. All of this is predicated on the idea that you can actually review though, and that's something that um, is very badly misunderstood in Buddhism, that you can't review yourself, you need to have a teacher who's already enlightened, who is part of this mythical lineage of um, people who are enlightened all the way down to the Buddha. And if you somehow manage to, if you've got the good karma to meet such a person, then they can tell you what's going on and give you instructions about what to do with your practice. So if you were trying to learn carpentry, well, you don't need a perfect carpenter to teach you. You just need somebody who's better than you are. If it was, the perfect carpenter is ideal, right? But you're not going to find it. What you need is somebody who's better than you and somebody that you can get along with. And then also what you need to do is just constantly review yourself and have this commitment to self-improvement. Awesome! <laughs> Empowerment. I think adding the addition of reading the Sutta um, is a good reminder for lay people. Yeah. They often say it's just too hard to read it. Yeah. But there's a really good book that you recommend it. Yep. Might like to recommend some books for them. Sure, sure. So I think, Sarani, you've already gotten into In the Buddha's Words by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to read it. <laughs> yes. So get, get onto it as an introduction to early Buddhism. Um, now, the other thing in relation to the, um, the textual teacher, the suttas, is that for the average modern person, they're absolutely boring. So unless you've got some kind of past life practice that really gives you an infinity with really repetitive texts, <laughs> then you're going to find them really, really boring. And that's because we're modern people and we don't understand um, the way the culture has changed and how much we've actually lost from ancient culture. So it works like this. 2,500 years ago, people did not have televisions, which meant they had imaginations. So... How did people get entertained 2,500 years ago? Well, you sit around a fire, there's a storyteller. And the storyteller changes his voice, changes his face, moves his hands around, a bit like a really good comedian. Changes character for a moment and they're just doing subtle things. And that enables the audience, it just primes the audience's imagination and literally what is happening inside the mind of the audience member is they see like this television screen in front of the storyteller <laughs> and they're seeing all these images and all these sounds coming out of the storyteller. The combination of the storyteller's skill and the audience's own skillfulness and imagination. Right? So if you had a stor an average storyteller today, I'd say still a lot of people would find it entertaining, but a lot of people would find it dead boring. <laughs> Where's the special effects? Where's the music? The suttas are repetitive because that's not meant to be the main game. It's just a backbone. It just gives these essential points and essential ideas. And then you're meant to contemplate them. You're meant to construct your own story around them. You're meant to bring them to life yourself. And the more you work on bringing them to life, the more every time you just recite the dot points, you see this entire universe unfolding before your eyes. And that's what makes chanting really, really pleasurable. That the chanting is like turning on the television to Discovery Channel.
And that's a really good um, tip for students in learning as well. It's really important to write your own notes. That you reformulate what you've been taught in your own language in dot points and then you mind map around them. You develop a relationship with your set of notes and, and to anybody else is really boring. But to you, it ought to be that every time you look at your set of notes, a whole universe is just unfurling before your eyes. So this is why imagination is really important to academic learning. The more imaginative the relationship our students, and the, the way that the student relates um, to the thing that they're learning, the more interesting it is, the more memorable it is. Yeah, I, uh, Jnana Ponikos, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it would be different, um, but I'm not sure because I, I, in what way, because I haven't read Jnana Ponikos book. Yeah, great. Great question. Leaders are really, really important. And because they're so important, it's absolutely essential that they're virtuous. Now, leaders are important because leadership is an incredibly hard job. It's incredibly stressful. Those of you who have become managers we well, remember a time where you were just a worker. And it was like, well, I just need to do my job. Right? I've got my job description and I just do my job. <laughs> and you know, it, it sucks sometimes because my manager, my boss comes in and criticizes me. But you know, in the end, still, it's just me. You know, I've got my part inside the organization. If it's a good organization, I feel like I belong. I, um, I'm appreciated. Um, but I don't need to worry about the entire organisation. <laughs> of course, you, then you go up a level. And the moment you're a manager, it's not just like your technical job that you need to do. And you need to make sure that you just, you know, you did your technical thing with excellence. Then all of a sudden, you need to worry about people's emotions. You need to know about um, whether or not they learn through the ear or they learn through the eye. You need to know about what their pay expectation is. You need to know what culture they come from. You know, it's just this, this whole new world. In other words, you need to really understand human beings as opposed to just understand your work. Also, the other thing that's hard about being a leader is that you stick out like a sore thumb and everybody's criticizing you all the time. <laughs> of course, a lot of people will love you as well, but in the end, you know, the moment you stick out, people will criticize you. See, so if you can't take that fact, then you're not going to end up being a leader, right? So there are two, two types of people in the world, generally speaking, who are capable of becoming leaders, therefore. People who are incredibly wise and resilient through their wisdom and psychopaths who just don't care about what anybody else thinks. Do we get a lot of wise people into leadership positions these days? Do we get the other kind of person inside leadership positions these days? Now, the first barrier against psychopaths getting to leadership positions is a culture of virtue. Ordinary people, even if they cannot become leaders, because they just don't have the emotional makeup to be resilient enough to take all of that stuff all the time. They have to be concerned with virtue. They cannot just take it for granted that the leaders are going to be bad. With a lot of technical ability, able to work 16 hours a day, but they're bad people. How do you measure virtue? You've got to be concrete. You start with the five precepts.
you got to ask yourself about your leaders and if you're becoming a leader. Do I kill? Do I steal? Do I commit sexual misconduct? Do I lie? Do I take drink and drugs? If you're becoming a leader, you don't do those things. You do not deserve to be there. You are leading people astray. But if you do those things and you're really committed to those things, you will get strong. You see, a part of being able to take criticism and all the stress of people management is a deep belief in your own integrity. Because people are going to be criticising you all the time. People are going to be second-guessing you all the time. If you do not have the experience of your own integrity through constantly purifying your own virtue, the moment anybody's going to give you feedback, really, because that's what criticism is, you will react against it and rationalise. Whereas if you have integrity and somebody accuses you of doing something wrong, badly wrong, the first you think is, well, that might be right, but it doesn't sound like me. Because I know I'm a person of integrity. I work really hard on it. But, and so you're inside this calm space when people throw all the criticism. It doesn't drive you mad. And then because you're calm and you have this kind of energetic integrity from your integrity, you're able to kind of take in the feedback and think, okay, let me think about it. And then you can either say, well, no, you're just completely wrong. A lot of people just will get things completely wrong. And other times you'll look at it and say, ah, yeah, he said it the wrong way. He was really angry and rude when he said it, but I can see he's about 5% right. And thank you. I've, I've learned something I didn't know about myself. So it sounds really simple. Five precepts. It's so powerful if you take it seriously. So the first step is five precepts in terms of not doing certain things yourself. Not killing, not stealing, etc., etc. But then it goes all the way to enlightenment in terms of doing the positive side. So instead of not killing, you can be compassionate to all living beings with both direct actions as well as the indirect consequences of your, of your actions. Trying to structure your life and structure your community so that um, living beings don't, don't get killed. That we don't design societies that run on war, for example, or design food economies that run on torturing animals, for example. Now, the other thing about leadership is there are three ways to motivate human action. One is through greed and delusion. The other one is hatred and delusion. I'll talk about those two first and then I'll tell you the third. This manifests in all sorts of ways that we see in history. So, hatred and delusion as a way to motivate human beings is totalitarianism, which is um, the direction that communism always goes. It's essentially people are scared and they do what they say because they don't want to get hit. And they'll do what you say, even though you don't have a gun inside your hand, but they know somebody behind you's got a gun. <laughs> now, totalitarianism, or in this period of history, communism, is not as effective as capitalism, which is motivating through greed and delusion. Oh, by the way, the delusion part is basically fraud. So you can maintain a system of violence for a relatively stable period at first because you're just lying to people. You're just lying to them about the fact that this system is good for them. And eventually they work it out and then things need to change. Now, the reason why totalitarianism like um, communism tends to lose against capitalism is that 
it's very energy intensive to be pushing people around all the time and monitoring them and pointing guns at them all the time. And also kills creativity. Capitalism, on the other hand, is based upon greed and delusion, right? The idea is you don't need to point guns at anyone. What you do is make them horribly greedy instead. Make them addicted to material things and money. And then they do things voluntarily. But it's only voluntary in inverted commas because you have to lie to them as well. You have to lie to them that these material things are actually going to do them good in the long term. You need to lie to them about how many people on this earth can actually live a middle class lifestyle by Australian standards. You need to lie to them about how many resources there actually are in the world. You need to lie to them about how much pollution you need to create to create that many material things in, short, in a short period of time. Yeah? So again, basically you need to cause delusion inside their mind about whether or not it's actually good for them. And then eventually they work it out as well. But capitalism wins out in terms as a way of leading and motivating people over totalitarianism because people think that they're free. They do things voluntarily, which means they're more creative and they're more willing to work at the grindstone. Like you'll be willing to work 16 hours a day at the grindstone because you think that it's good for you. Whereas the attitude of a person in the old Soviet Union was basically the attitude of a slave. I'm going to do as little work as possible. I'm going to do that amount of work because when I, once I reach that point, then they're not going to beat me up and throw me into the gulag. But I'm not going to go past there because everyone's getting paid the same anyway. And so what's the point? So you can actually get people to work much harder in a capitalist system than you can in a, in a totalitarian system. But in the end, they both collapse because they're both based on lies. So what's the third option? Well, option number three is motivating people through inspiration and truth. The Dhamma. That's one of the translations of the Dhamma, the truth. Leaders who stand up first with their five precepts and say, I will stand up for these precepts and you inspire other people. And everyone else at first says, you're mad. What are you, some kind of religious crazy, some kind of Puritan? You won't drink? You won't lie? Well, everybody else here does. Get back into line. And you say, no. There's more important things to life. Find me. I'll find somebody who does value the truth. And if I can't find anybody, then I shall leave. Empower people, tell them the truth. Inspire them. Get them to do work that is actually in their interest and everybody else's interest at the same time. Then you'll get people really working. And none of that work will be lost. None of it will go into useless things which can make a whole lot of money. But instead you'll create families, communities, schools, businesses which do a whole lot of work that improve everybody inside the production system and help everybody outside as well. Okay, would it be fair to say that the two, the first two system of motivating people mm. would be applicable to the modern day life, even in a capitalist country such yeah. as Australia? We can find this in a micro size. Say, for example, I walk past um, or I drive past a church or a temple, mm. and they would have lots of old people mm. with mops and everything, cleaning, brushing, and so on. Mm. So, I guess um, there one might argue that, or might say that, perhaps these people are motivated because they are having some kind of um, motivation to mm. read or yeah. obtaining merits, for yeah. example. Would that be applicable as well in terms of um, not necessarily um, countries where they have the views of capitalism or yeah. communism? It's yeah. actually happening within the micro society of Absolutely. that society. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's um, a great point. And the reason why it's actually more useful not to think in terms of capitalism or communism, but to think in terms of, is this a greed-based system with delusion and hatred operating in the background? Or is it a hatred-based system with greed and delusion operating in the background? And then you'll be able to see um, basically every trick of a bad management system no matter where you go. So in the case of religion, religions always get off the ground and become cancerous institutions. When the um, ecclesiastics become the key holders to heaven and people who just think to themselves well the key holders to heaven and hell actually right I've got to um, join the institution because if I don't well there's fear of hell um, and if I do join the institution then there's also the greed of heaven and any sort of system that's based upon membership privilege through membership instead of privilege through merit is always going to create really bad outcomes. What we want to do instead is um, always talk about how in the end, what really matters is not whether or not we're, whether we're Buddhists or Christians um, or Islamic. What matters is whether we're virtuous. You know, on that really concrete level, let's leave out the meditation, the oneness with God, and what all that is. You know, the thing that really matters on the concrete level for society, for things like the school, is whether or not we're virtuous. And in order to motivate people to um, mop the floor, um, or to clean the toilets, as I know you from time to time do, Mr. Powell. To do all of these things, not, okay, if you're a Buddhist and you belong to a Buddhist school, then you're going to heaven. But if you're virtuous by doing these things, if you make yourself a better person, that's, you know, real merit in the sense of a meritocratic society. You're actually a better person. then you deserve to rise inside this world and the next as well. And that makes people intelligent in the way that they do things. Because they need to ask themselves, well, what is the good? And what actions are connected to the good? As opposed to, right, it doesn't matter what I do, so long as I follow orders, or so long as I belong to the group. Very good. So thank you very much for joining us here at Power Buddha School for this celebration of WESAC and our myth-busting session. May you all be very well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.